Hello, everyone. Very good morning to you all, or good evening, or good middle of the night, wherever you are in the world. Uh, joining us uh, here in Barcelona, um, welcome to the uh, seventh international workshop on the sharing economy. Uh, my name is Julie Wilson. Um, I'm Associate Dean for Research here in the Faculty of Economics and Business at the Open University of Catalonia, or WOC, as we call it affectionately. Um, and you'll have more for me in a moment, but uh, first of all, I'd like to hand over to uh, uh, my two colleagues. First, in first place, uh, Angel Cito, uh, who is the Vice Rector for um, uh, Competitiveness and, and Occupation here at the WOC, and uh, also Mari Jesus Martinez, who is the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Economics and Business here at the WOC, who uh, will be your host for, for these days. So uh, over to you, Angel. Hello. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you very much for being virtually with us today at the seventh international workshop on the sharing economy. I am particularly excited to have the opportunity to open this event for three different reasons. First, because it's the result of a collective effort that began a few years ago. Secondly, because it coincides with the celebration of the 25 years of the University Foundation and also the 25th anniversary of the creation of the Faculty of Business and Economics. And third, because I'm doing this opening accompanied with panelism of asking ourselves the right question, the team of economics and business at the WOC a few years ago, I think four years or even five, asked itself how the study of the sharing economy could promise us to project our academic work as a faculty of economics and business. At that time, and being aware of the scope of this new paradigm, we considered that its exploration was an opportunity in many ways. First, because it guided our academic activity towards a phenomenon that was transforming the economic relations. In addition, we were aware that uh, this study allowed us to be an active stakeholder in the transformation process, not only of the economy, but also the organizations and the public sector. Thirdly, this cut cutting phenomenon covered mostly all our expertise, and therefore it was a meeting point for all of us. And finally, it was an excellent opportunity to endorse our rich teaching, innovation and transfer activity, and also to connect this activity with other people and other institutions as we will do this uh, next days. Well, all this effort to integrate the sharing economy into our academic activity is rewarded today with the honor of hosting this event, which is focused on sharing economy, which, is, which integrates the different expertise of our academia, which has an international reach and which is the result of a shared effort and enthusiasm. So just a final word to thank you again for giving me the opportunity of opening it. Thank you very much for so many years of collaboration and I wish you a very productive days of sharing. Thank you very much. Good morning, Vice Rector. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, workshop participants and welcome everyone. First of all, thanks a lot for your words, Angels Fito. For me, it's also a great pleasure to be opening this long-awaited workshop and so well accompanied. The truth is that the preparation for this workshop have taken quite a lot longer than originally planned. The pandemic didn't allow us to meet in Barcelona at the Dam Factory and Macaya Palace last July as was our original intention. And despite the fact that we can meet in person today, I'm very happy to be opening this workshop at this time. It's always a great opportunity to share knowledge about sharing culture, the sharing economy, and platform economies. But in times like this, in which the pandemic has hit the economy and society in general very hard, more than ever, we need to talk about what it means to share. It's a time to be analyzing the conditions under which this vision can contribute to create a more sustainable world that is respectful of people and the environment. The key to building the present and the future. As Angels Fito has explained, some years ago, our faculty launched a strategic initiative that sought to analyze the impact of sharing practice on the economy. But importantly, at the same time, we also adopted the sharing philosophy as a way of organizing our own activities through working together. 
So these visions affects the way we do our teaching, promoting collaborative learning and knowledge of the sharing economy our, among our students. Likewise, it underpins our research and knowledge transfer activities. But especially, it affects the way we organize ourselves as a team, as professors of a faculty of economic and business in which our model is we are sharing. That's almost it from me. Though I must also mention what a great joy is to have the opportunity to inaugurate the interesting and refreshing workshop in which the faculty has been so involved. Both in terms of hosting and leading its organization, as well as the research contributions that the different professors of the faculty will make. Moreover, in this special year in which we celebrate our first 25 years, in which we have always been driving by the impulse to transform the society through education and research. I invite you now to share your knowledge during these three days and enrich debates on sharing cultures and practice. I'm sure that all of this will contribute to transforming society in some measure. Remember that each of us, within their own scope of action, can contribute to transforming reality. So please, let's not stop exploring this possibility. Well, actually, I will say more here. Let's not stop carrying that responsibility. The responsibility to be drivers of change and to contribute to transforming society, making it more responsible and sustainable, more sharing. I hope you enjoy the workshop and welcome to you all. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Rector Angel Svito and, and, and Dean of the Faculty, Mare Jesus Martinez. So, um, so our hope for the next three days is that this, this COVID-imposed virtuality won't detract from us having a, a really good and engaging time in, uh, within the workshop. So a warm welcome to you all. Yeah, granted, it's not quite the same as welcoming you to Barcelona, as Mare Jesus mentioned, which we would have loved to have, do, to have done last July. We had some great ideas of, of where to take you all, but that will have to wait for a future edition, I think. Um, so what I must say is that in spite of the virtuality, our whole team has worked really hard to make sure that the workshop runs smoothly. So we're crossing our fingers and um, we hope as well that it creates a strong catalyst for, for creating some new research connections and maintaining the existing ones that many of us already share. Now, uh, as Dr. Fito and Dr. Martinez have already said, as a faculty, we have a long-standing commitment to sharing culture in, across the board of our day-to-day of our -day activities as a faculty, you know, and, um, and we strive to adopt sharing as a kind of underlying position or philosophy. And one of these research activities, and it's a really fun one, actually, is a, a, a faculty reading group on the sharing economy, which we've been doing for quite a few years now. Uh, and, and in this session, we, we basically choose an interesting article to read and debate. Uh, and then according to, to the orientation of the article, we invite all the authors to connect with us or we invite somebody from a, 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 a platform and a platform entrepreneur from a local platform or different social agents, public sector representatives and so on. So it was in one of these sharing economy reading group sessions must have been three years ago now that uh, we invited uh, Professor Kuhn Franken to join us uh, to discuss an article he wrote, a really great article he wrote with uh, Professor Juliet Shaw. Uh, and it was during the, these conversations around that article that uh, the, the possibility came up to host the seventh edition of, of this incredible workshop. Uh, and in fact, I mean, when we were talking about this, this was actually before uh, the sixth edition in, in Utrecht, which, by the way, was fantastic. And that's a hard act to follow, I have to say. But it was also before the fifth -ish edition in, in Mannheim. So we're talking quite a few years ago now. And, and between the pandemic and, and all this planning, uh, we're really grateful and, and actually quite relieved to be able to, <laughs> to be with you today. Uh, that, that, those three, that three years ago seems like a world away. And, uh, but yeah, I think that's enough nostalgia for pre-COVID times. Uh, so yeah, we jumped at the chance to host the workshop and, and we're very glad to be doing so. One thing we're really, really delighted about is the wide range of backgrounds of our participants. If you look through the, um, the, the affiliations of, of 130 plus participants in this workshop, in disciplinary and cultural terms, but also in geographical terms, the diversity is, is, is really, really uh, impressive. We're a very mixed bunch in a good sense. 
and uh, participants actually are based in 25 different countries across four continents and I think that's that's a great achievement to uh, for, for this workshop uh, in the format that we bring it to you uh, that the, the participation is so international uh, and as we know as well that the sharing and platform economies are inherently multidisciplinary in, in terms of how we come at them as researchers. We also emerge from a huge range of disciplinary backgrounds. If you just have a look at people's bio biographies, uh, uh, you can see what an enormous diversity of topics are being researched within the sharing economy and from different disciplinary and interdisciplinary perspectives. So we really couldn't have hoped for better uh, following a year in which COVID-19 shook us all up a little bit. And, uh, and so we're immensely grateful for you for, for joining us, albeit virtually. Uh, so uh, for the next three days, we have a really uh, fantastic program. Uh, I'm very excited to say that we have four great keynotes, uh, the first of which will follow this session. We also have 14 fantastic parallel sessions. And, and these parallel sessions cover many different aspects and really are a kind of testimony to how diverse the, uh, the topic has become uh, as a field of inquiry. And um, between all this academic uh, exchange, which is going to be very lively and, and enjoyable, I'm sure, uh, we hope we've left enough time to have, have a break between sessions and, uh, and even to have lunch and this kind of thing. I think we've all learned over this past year that video conferencing uh, can make for some very dense working days. You know? But uh, we hope that this workshop is an excuse to uh, disconnect from your day to day for a few days and uh, engage with some of the really great research that's going on in this field. Uh, under the umbrella of the seventh edition of, of this workshop and, uh, and that we can all connect with each other from across our different parts of the field. Just to let you know that uh, uh, in the plenary sessions uh, in which we are now and the, and the rest of the keynote sessions are, are being retransmitted via YouTube and you'll find the, uh, our colleagues from the WOC uh, moderating in the YouTube chat. So if you have any questions for the presenters or would like to make any comments, please feel free to... Um, to dabble in the chat window of, of YouTube. And in the parallel sessions, which are being held via Zoom, and you'll find the links in the, in the program uh, within each, each individual parallel session, uh, you can pose your questions to the presenters in, in the chats in Zoom instead. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that these plenary sessions are being recorded. So uh, uh, after today, you'll be able to, to rewatch them at your leisure um, uh, via the same link on YouTube. And we'll remind of those links later as well. Uh, so basically, that's it from me as your co-chair for the event, and uh, please stay connected now as I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Josep Yados from the Faculty of Economics and Business, and he'll be chairing our first keynote address, which will be made by uh, Lund University's Professor Oksana Munt, and we're delighted to have her with us. Let's start with the first keynote presentation. I'm Josep Llodos, Professor at Economics and Business Department in the Open University of Catalonia. It's my pleasure to briefly introduce you the topic and the speaker of this session. We will start talking about sustainability and cultures and how they are shaping the landscape of sharing economy in cities with one of the main experts in this field, Professor Oksana Amont. Oksana Amont is Professor in Sustainable Consumption and Production at the International Institute for Industrial Environmental Economics at Lund University in Sweden. She holds a PhD in engineering, a master of science degree in environmental management and policy, and a master of science degree in biology and chemistry. Her current areas of interest are sustainable consumption and production, 
and sustainable life lifestyles. But she's also interested in many other topics as the role of retailers in promoting sustainability along supply chains, product service systems, social innovation, corporate social responsibility, and envirom environmental policy, among others. She's also currently involved in several research projects related to urban sharing, circular economy, and sustainable consumption, as probably we will realize in the next minutes. So I'm very pleased to share this keynote presentation with her and eager to know and listen comments and ideas about sharing economy and sustainability. And after the presentation, we will have a few minutes for questions. Oksana, welcome to the international workshop. Thank you very much, Joseph, and thank you very much uh, to the organizers. Uh, I'm really humbled and honored uh, to be able to hold this keynote uh, speech. So it will be about sharing economy, sustainability, cultures, institutionalizations, and in the true uh, nature of multidisciplinarity, I will take you on this crazy ride. So hang on with me. Uh, I would like to start with talk with the takeaways in case I will run out of time. And they are threefold. Uh, we are working in uh, interdisciplinary field, which is sharing economy. And there we continuously conceptualize uh, as this phenomenon evolves. One takeaway is that we need to continue conceptualizing and carving out definitions, concepts, um, and trajectories of how this interesting phenomenon develops. And we need to do this across disciplines. I will show you that it's not an easy journey. The second point is assessment. Uh, and this has to do with the contested nature of sharing economy, of its business models, of how it interacts with actors in society, how it evolves in the uh, cities and in national um, contexts. So there we also need to continue developing cross-disciplinary tools so we can use them for comparative studies. The last point I want to make and resonates well with the um, presentations earlier today, welcoming us to the workshop, that what we want with all this academic work is to see the real life impact. And I will talk uh, as I go with my presentation about the need and our own efforts to operationalize uh, the tools we are developing in the academic world. Just to get you into the context uh, and the starting point for me on this journey with sharing economy, um, I'm representing a project that is called Urban Sharing, which is funded by European Research Council. This is a great privilege to have five-year financing and be able to summon a great uh, team of researchers. The aim of the project is threefold. It's to understand how institutionalization processes of sharing in different urban contexts unfold. It's to understand the design of the sharing platforms and their business models in different uh, contexts. And to discuss the sustainability uh, impacts of sharing. We do this work in uh, across five cities uh, in the global um, uh, context. I have with me a great urban sharing team of researchers and um, administrator, and we are all, all working across different topics within these three main directions. <clears throat> Our starting point, because we deal with sustainability and assessments, which is easier to do with the, sorry for that, <laughs> the slides are jumping. Uh, we are looking at three sectors uh, of physical goods, space, mobility, and uh, physical goods sharing, such as clothes, books, and toys. Our unit of analysis is quite complex, as you see. Uh, the platform itself, uh, it also contains asset owners and asset users, the peers who own the resources and exchange them. We also place our work in the cities because we're interested in the communication between the platforms and the cities, as well as their embeddedness in societal institutions. In terms of methodology, we developed something called mobile research labs, which we um, held in different cities. We had previous project where we looked at Amsterdam, Toronto, uh, the current project we're looking at Amsterdam, Toronto, Shanghai, but before we also looked at Berlin, London, San Francisco, and two sharing cities in Sweden, Malmo and Gothenburg. 
So I'm bringing uh, all the knowledge from all the cities. Um, we've been working on this uh, project in uh, five years now. So there we combine the mobile research labs that when we visit cities, we interview different actors. We conduct workshops with them. We of course do uh, desktop studies. We involve sustainability impact assessments, both in terms of life cycle assessments and bringing uh, input output and other economic assessments. So this is where we start. But for me, this journey started much earlier. It started actually last century. Um, in 1999, I was a newly started PhD student uh, who was fascinated to work on the topics where we were hoping to see how products can be transformed into services, how the product uh, ownership can be changed uh, towards um, providing uh, services or functions or uh, utility of the products and the consumers would pay not for the products themselves, but for getting access. At that time, it was uh, called product service systems, basically a system of products and services that delivers value in use to consumers, while product ownership stays with the producer or a service provider. So we worked at the time on developing business models where pools of products or services can be delivered to consumers close to where they live. So we worked with tenant associations, the units where we can access uh, people, but where also uh, they don't need to travel so much to get access to these products. Sharing individual assets, which is the core of what became now a sharing economy, was completely out of question at that uh, time. In 2002, we conducted um, a survey with more than 1,000 households in Sweden, asking them not about sharing their uh, physical assets, but in case they would like to have more capacity on their computers, would they be interested in increasing um, this memory, basically, uh, by getting access to extra, extra space online, where they could store their documents and photos. And that was 2002, and less than 30% of people were interested um, in exploring this idea. So these were the times and since then a lot has changed in how we perceive um, access of something and as well as sharing something with others. Um, the development of product service systems continued and in 2004, Arnold Tucker developed this um, useful typology where he distinguished between product oriented services basically services uh, that offer maintenance or after sales support uh, to products, uh, user-oriented services in principle renting and leasing, and then result-oriented services where you as customer get access uh, to services uh, conducted by someone else. For me, this, this is the starting, uh, the origin of how um, different concepts then evolved. So product-oriented services evolved into um, part of the circular economy, the idea that focuses on improving uh, product design, reverse logistics, uh, refurbishment and remanufacturing of products to enable the circularity of products and resources in our society. Result-oriented services on the other hand evolved uh, into what is now called gig economy. So basically it's leasing and renting of not products, but skills and time of individuals. And then user-oriented services, they are <clears throat> slowly evolving into the sharing economy. So there the idea is basically that, and the true innovation is that um, the um, uh, idling resources, underutilized resources or assets in society are being activated. Another innovation in this sense um, in the sharing economy is that it's not the manufacturing company um, that provides uh, the services anymore, but it's a third party that organizes the marketplace where uh, asset owners uh, have possibility to share uh, access to their products with um, asset users who would like to have a temporary access to these products. <clears throat> so, this is only part of the sharing economy. Another part uh, actually stayed with use, within user-oriented services. And there uh, we see all the uh, current uh, business to consumer 
um, PSS. At the same time, unfortunately, we often see lumping together of these uh, different concepts. I still find this picture by uh, Kohn Franken and Juliet Shore um, very useful because it helps us position again the sharing economy. Here we see that uh, what I talked about, the user-oriented product service systems, uh, they are supported by business to consumer um, uh, business models, and they are different from peer to peer. In the sense peer to peer can be anybody, um, it can be individuals, businesses and public organizations, but they are not necessarily the business to consumer um, models in which uh, usually a company or an organization buys um, or produces new products and then offers it for uh, access to, to consumers. In peer-to-peer, -peer, we see that it's the used uh, products or idling assets of uh, organizations that are being activated and utilized by multiple users. We therefore talk about idling of physical assets, which distinguishes it from the gig economy that looks at the services, time and skills. And then we talk about access over ownership, which is to distinguish it from the secondhand economy where it, the ownership for the product is transferred uh, down the line. So in my work, as I said, we are um, a big team, uh, we all have different backgrounds and we have these three dimensions with which we are working with. This means that we draw in our work on uh, different disciplines, on different conceptualizations, frameworks in order to develop our work. So of course, when we started our work, we started with defining the sharing economy. Um, my colleague Stephen uh, Curtis and Matthias Lerner did a systematic literature review. It took almost a year in order to define these features for the sharing economy. They came up with the, these uh, building blocks. It is ICT mediated. Uh, it's non-pecuniary motivation for ownership, meaning that the sharing economy leverages the idling capacity of an existing stock of goods, which distinguishes it again from business uh, to consumer models of PSS. It provides temporary access, um, so the practices do not lead to transfer of ownership. It involves rivalrous um, resources or assets, which means that the use of a shared good prevents the simultaneous use by another, and we look at the tangible goods. What is interesting also in uh, sharing economy, we talk about triadic business models, which mediate two-sided markets, meaning that we have two uh, users that are involved and create uh, value. At the same time, a platform is not the one that creates value. What it does is facilitates value creation, while value is co-created with asset owners and asset users. This also has implications for the sustainability profile. If we would like the sharing economy to be sustainable, it's not only that we need to work with platforms, we need to also engage asset owners and asset users. So when working with business models, we utilize Osterwalder business model canvas and the suggestion from our research is that the value delivery or value creation is actually value facilitation if we are working with um, the platforms. This work has been uh, taken further and um, uh, Stephen Curtis developed this um, uh, morphological framework that we use to distinguish different uh, diversities um, or different types of uh, business models and sharing economy and their characteristics. So here we talk about three value dimensions, value facilitation, value delivery, and value capture, uh, 16 attributes, and we have 67 choices. Why we do that, um, or how this can be uh, operationalized in further work? This work is taken further into a quantitative clustering analysis that allows us to distinguish uh, features of business models and cluster them in um, certain ways. This will be used in uh, order to compare how uh, different types of business models emerge in different cities and then explain why this is happening. 
our work on uh, business models also um, relies on institutionalism literature. And there we see that um, <clears throat> platforms are really challenge uh, many prevalent and traditional institutions in the society, such as the role of state, corporation, market, profession, as well as uh, institutions on family and community. So <clears throat> on the one hand, the platforms are not the typical companies that own production assets and have traditional innovation cycles. Instead, they capitalize on idling assets owned by individuals and other actors. They typically start as tiny startups with great idea that get support from venture capitalists and then who tend also um, support them uh, in the long run. These platforms use web and app-based technologies and because they establish um, direct contact between the users, they bypass intermediaries and reduce significantly the transaction costs. Platforms, as I said, they themselves, they don't own any resources, and this makes it difficult for them to control the marketplace. They are therefore continuously working on matching supply and demand sides of the market, basically balancing between the asset owners and asset users. Consequently, they also have no direct control over the quality of products um, that are offered on their platform, but they are developing different mechanisms to secure good descriptions, visualizations of the offers, to create trust between um, the users. Um, and also um, they provide own ranking uh, to help best performing asset owners and users to stand out. The also interesting part is that the platforms take the role of a regulator or the state by setting up the rules of how to behave on the platform, but also they rely on user-based mechanisms, um, rating systems and reviews, so they can control the compliance, uh, punish non-compliers and also uh, resolve the disputes. So they become essentially safe regulators instead of the state. Um, also compared to traditional corporations, they have limited liability as they do not uh, employ people. Asset owners and asset users are independent actors who can join platform or leave it as they please. And also what is interesting is that um, the uh, platforms, uh, they find themselves participating essentially in two uh, markets. They on one hand compete with other platforms on the so-called capital market because they are competing for the attention of investors. At the, at the same time, they also provide uh, space for competition of asset owners for asset users. So this is um, a very different than what we see in traditional companies. When we look at the asset owners, uh, for them, as I said, they can join um, and leave platforms as they want. For them, uh, managing the assets is not a profession with well-defined features but it's something they can do either on the side. Increasingly, however, it is uh, becoming prof professionalized as we uh, see um, in the case of Airbnb with a lot of hosts are actually professional companies, uh, professional real estate managers. Also the drivers uh, of Uber, Lyft and similar companies, uh, they um, pick up this um, type of work um, as, as a full time um, income generating machine. Um, asset users, on the other hand, um, they are also peers. Uh, they seek to gain temporary access to uh, resources. They're not interested in asset ownership. And in this way, they challenge access-based consumption. Um, to ensure uh, quality of the resources and services they seek to use, they rely on reviews of other peers. And it's also the, their role evolves in the sharing economy from passive consumers to much more active um, um, asset stickers um, in the sharing economy. This also, as I said, this uh, distinction between asset owners, asset users and platforms is not uh, semantic because it has implications for the sustainability of um, sharing platforms. 
So when we work with sustainability impacts, of course, we work, uh, we understand the sharing economy platforms, they operate um, online, but they're also embedded in many cities and the city, uh, cities influence the way how they operate. So for that, we also work with uh, developing understanding how to account for the city context. And this work is ongoing, but what is clear is that um, <clears throat> there are city-specific um, contextual indicators that affect the sharing economy. And when we want to compare how the sharing economy evolves in different cities, we need to compare them with the same lens. So we've been uh, developing um, different indicators. Uh, we divide them by the segment of the sharing um, economy, mobility, accommodation, physical assets. And then we arrived at um, a set of uh, six categories. So when we come to our city, first we need to scan and understand the profile of the city in terms of its governance, geography and demographics, economy, infrastructure, the innovation, and as well as social cultural um, conditions. But then we, of course, when we talk about sustainability uh, evaluations, we talk about um, social, environmental, and economic. And when we started our work on social uh, impacts, when this, we map the territory through a systematic literature review uh, to arrive at the conclusion that there are no systematic frameworks to measure social impacts of sustainability. So we decided to develop our own framework, first starting with literature, but then evolving, <clears throat> involving stakeholders to define the social indicators that are relevant for them. We arrived at the social um, impact um, uh, framework with uh, four main aspects, which are empowerment, social justice, inclusivity and trust, and 18 indicators. But then what we realized is that finding the list of indicators um, is not enough. What is important is uh, to realize that, again, the triangular, the triadic business model where we have platform um, asset owner and asset user they uh, have implications also for when we want to assess uh, social sustainability because the relevance of these indicators for these three actors is very different. So now we are in the stage of operationalizing the tool by developing uh, indicators and customizing them to these three main actors. When we work with environmental and economic evaluations, uh, this is also something different from how the literature um, presents uh, itself and the, um, uh, what we know. And we identified research gaps that there are very few quantitative assessments of environmental and economic impacts of sharing. There is predominant focus on direct environmental impacts and secondary and wider effects are underexplored. So our approach uh, is to look at, try to look at both direct and indirect impacts. Uh, we go and work with case study based assessments where we weave in behavioral aspects, uh, bring in business model designs and try to account for city infrastructural aspects and contexts. So as I said before, we use life cycle assessments for direct impacts and hybrid input output LCAs for indirect and macro effects. And this work is in progress. But we work with the Amsterdam and there we uh, try to understand sustainability implications of shared mobility in the use phase. Here we see that uh, transportation habits, uh, we are as uh, asking question, what are the changes in transportation habits of individuals that join car sharing? So not only understanding the impact of car sharing on them, but also how it changes their transportation habits and also how these changes in uh, greenhouse has emissions at the city level are changing due to the new uh, transportation habits of individuals. We built uh, scenarios where we uh, start have a starting point with car dependent lifestyle and car free lifestyle. These are very different. And then we uh, also, as I said, we design scenarios accounting for the traveling habits for uh, policy uh, at city level and also with the different business models. 
In another, in another study, we are looking at um, consumption induced carbon emissions of car sharing and their research questions were, how does car sharing influence the disposable income of uh, car sharing participants? Again, uh, bringing together the environmental and economic aspects um, of sustainability. We ask ourselves how consumption patterns change among sharing users and what is the carbon balance between uh, car sharers and those that do not use car sharing. What we see is that, of course, environmental gains are uh, come from the shorter travel distances. Um, the impacts of responding could be high in uh, carbon intensive impact categories for some users. But what we find is that it's actually the rebound effects from induced indirect consumption do not offset the carbon savings of car sharing because they're simply too small. Our next uh, di direction we are working um, on are, um, is about institutionalization, essentially asking ourselves the question, how can, um, how sharing economy is evolving in different uh, cities, how it gets normalized. And here we rely on um, double uh, dual dynamics of institutionalization, where we look at the platforms uh, and their institutional work as well as at the role of municipality, city governance, uh, government, and how they uh, govern uh, the sharing economy. So when we look closer at institutional work uh, by platforms, uh, this can be distinguished into regulatory work, normative work, and uh, cultural cognitive work. Let's have a look at how they uh, manifest themselves. So many organizations, especially those for profit sharing organizations, they involve in litigation because they are uh, pressed by cities uh, who would like to regulate them. Now, seeing the negative uh, impacts that many of these platforms create in the cities. So, for example, in San Francisco, there was a restriction uh, or uh, answer from the um, uh, Airbnb, VRBO and home away when they would like uh, wanted to introduce uh, strict regulations. Um, another uh, mechanism is lobbying. So not many uh, sharing organizations can afford um, to litigate, um, to go to court uh, with city um, governments. So they instead resort to lobbying efforts and for that they form uh, inter-industrial associations or intra-industrial uh, associations, which represent their interest in, um, in their talks with regulators or policymakers. Um, and these uh, platforms work um, at city level or national level, or there are also international platforms. Then the other mechanisms they're using is actually demarcation to, uh, to define the boundaries of who belongs to uh, the sharing economy and, and who doesn't belong. So there are organizations that claim that they are true shares while all others are not. Uh, many other companies, we've heard many how Uber uh, tried to use the idea of that they are just tech company in order to avoid being subject of regulations developed for uh, sharing um, platforms. They also work with the norms uh, and here they are creating identities and constructing images also very much nonprofit platforms rely on creating a positive uh, on the rhetoric of creating positive social impact on communities social cohesion, while for profit platforms, they um, utilize the rhetoric of technological superiority efficiency and creating positive economic impacts. In that way, they are constructing, actually together, constructing an uh, image of a sharing economy that is um, much better alternative to the unsustainable status quo. And of course, this work is much more nuanced and sensitive to different contexts. So we are also finding examples, uh, many examples across cities where sharing organizations uh, try to um, align their work to the uh, city agendas for smart city agendas, but also sustainable city agendas. So highlighting their uh, positive impacts, for example, of mobility sharing on reducing congestion and air pollution in the cities, for example, such as London, where this is the critical issue, 
or highlighting the uh, social cohesion, inclusivity in uh, Swedish cities where social agenda is high. <clears throat> Finally, cultural cognitive work uh, is where uh, organizations use mimicry uh, and isomorphism, basically copying the, uh, the types of arrangements in traditional companies, for example, um, when Airbnb became um, successful, many other organizations followed the suit and developed similar business models. Now we have a um, resurgence of um, organizations that um, address the, and the negative impacts of uh, the beacons of sharing economy. So for example, there is a, a platform now that uh, is called Inclusive, which tries to reduce by its design, reduce the uh, negative uh, impacts of Airbnb in terms of inclusivity and exclusivity. We're also seeing how the sharing idea is being really um, embedded in many aspects of our life. We, uh, there is a new vocabulary emerging to Uberize something or it's an Airbnb for food. There is also uh, new currencies created. And also we see that um, the sharing organizations, they also um, engage in educating uh, their users, regulators, cities, um, and others. <clears throat> the second um, aspect of how we understand, uh, try to understand institutionalization in cities is through governance. And I just briefly touch upon this aspect or this aspect of our work because my uh, colleague Yulia will present it in one of the sessions. Here in this work, we also developed a comprehensive analytical municipal governance framework uh, where we distinguish five mechanisms of how the cities can engage with the sharing economy. And also we describe 11 uh, roles of municipal governance. We take this work now further and try to map the cities we are working in, in terms of their engagement with the sharing economy. And in, in order to understand the differences between the cities, we are now going back to our work on the city context and, and discuss the role of structural, economic, regulatory and political factors, but also sustainability agendas of cities, as well as cultural factors. Finally, I have one or two minutes left and I would like to finish by saying that all this work with sharing platforms um, building on uh, business models literature, embracing the institutionalism literature, trying to understand sustainability impacts. It all now came together in this um, times of, of the pandemic. And we've been able to um, do also some research on that, mapping the short-term impacts uh, on um, sharing platforms. Many of them uh, reduced their operations and lost their users by 90 to 95%. At the same time, we see uh, the resilience built in in these organizations, and we explore how these organizations respond uh, to uh, the pandemic. Uh, also here, we see the importance of this triadic business model because we see that platforms engage with their users, both asset owners and asset users, communicating, educating, and supporting them. We see how platforms respond by changing their daily operations, adapting their business models, and engaging in strategic long-term work, preparing for the post-COVID world. And we also see how these organizations support other societal actors, as well as manage their partnerships. So I will talk about, um, more specifically about the strategies, the platforms and form um, in the time of pandemic in one of the um, uh, sessions. Uh, we also looked in this work at long-term implications and there are a lot of learnings to be taken from um, this work of sharing organizations, how they persevere uh, about their resilience and about their potential sustainability impact. I would like to finish uh, this presentation with outlining future research or coming back to my three takeaways. We need to continue conceptualize um, and especially build on cross-disciplinary conceptualizations because I tried to show how our dispersed uh, bits of work uh, building on different um, disciplines are really benefiting and contributing to each other. 
we need to uh, develop and continue to develop the cross-disciplinary assessment tools applied in comparative studies across platforms with different business models, across platforms in the same and different sharing segments, across sharing segments and across city context. And finally, all these tools that we are developing, they need to be operationalized uh, to be able um, to be used by the platforms, by cities, by users, so that we can see in practice um, the real life impact of our work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Oksana, for, for this stimulating uh, presentation and, and congratulations because you did it. You did it in less than 40 minutes. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we, we have collected from the chat, from the YouTube chat, a few questions, and now we have some minutes for, for uh, uh, providing an answer to these questions. Let me check this, the information. Well, yes. Well, first we have a, a question from Gisela Millier. Uh, she is professor at the, of marketing in, in the Faculty of Economics and Business here at, at the work. And the question is how research institutes and universities can convince the European Union for including the sharing economy into the Horizon Europe 21-27 priorities. But at the same time, Stephen Curtis from the Lund University, probably you know, you know him, has provided some kind of of answer, and my, my question will be, what do you think about this? The, ans the answer from Stephen is the following. I position the sharing economy as part of the circular economy. The circular economy seeks to narrow, slow, and close resource loops. The sharing economy slows, uh, sorry, the sharing economy slows resource loads by increasing intensity of use and extending product lifetimes. With the EU promoting the circular economy in the new horizon package and the European Green Deal, Stephen thinks that the positioning may be helpful. Well, mm -hmm. what do you think about this? Um, yes, um, I think it's a good answer that Stephen uh, provides. Um, I also see the overlaps of uh, between the circular economy and the sharing economy. The important, of course, distinction is that um, in circular economy, a lot of focus is on, as I said, on how to improve products. So a product and process orientation, as well as a closing or material loops. The sharing economy, I think it's, it, um, it's worth uh, also focusing on it specifically because it opens up possibility of utilizing these idling resources. So there we cannot change their product design, but we can really design business models that help us uh, extend their product life um, and close um, or maximize the amount of loops we have in the use phase. So as long as um, we have research money uh, and priority on the circular economy where there is a space and niche for the sharing economy, I think we can still do great uh, research. Okay, thank you so much. We have a second question also from Professor Gisela Millet, and which is the following. How future research directions could be approached from a marketing research perspective? Which are the main gaps in your opinion? Marketing research is quite a broad uh, field of study. So I think it's important, um, as I highlight several times, uh, the, um, to take account of the uh, triadic nature of these business models. So questions for marketing professions can be uh, focusing on the platforms itself. That would be the most obvious one. But again, we have the two groups of users mm -hmm. that really um, are engaged in value co-creation but also in uh, creating the profile uh, and the brand name for the, uh, the platform. So the question there is, what is their role and actually effect on the platform brand name, for example? How can platforms uh, engage uh, both types of users in creating a positive uh, brand name, a positive sustainability profile? Uh, this could be the direction that I see for marketing. Okay. Thank you. There's another question from Damien Bunders. Uh, 
Uh, he's a PhD candidate at the Rotterdam School of Management in the Erasmus University. The question is the following. Why are nonprofit initiatives assumed to have no growth aspirations? Um, I wouldn't uh, say that this is true. Um, it's easy to think about that if, if you think of non-profit organizations in terms of very local and often offline platforms. Uh, but we have many examples of uh, global um, non-profit organizations. Couchsurfing was one until a certain point they became for-profit. Uh, warm showers, uh, many platforms where money do not exchange hands. So absolutely, they can be global and they, can, um, they should go global as well. Okay, thank you. A new question from uh, Professor Luis Garay, uh, also in the Faculty of Economics and, and Business here at, at, at WOC. The question is, what do you think might be the possibilities that public administration could be the promoters of some kind of collaborative platform? In fact, Yuliva Voitenko palgan has provided some kind of, of, uh, of answer saying that municipalities would promote sharing economy organizations and collaborative initiatives if they see their actions align with the sustainability agendas of cities. And say that there are, and also is saying that there are many examples from Sweden, particularly strengthening social cohesion, democracy and justice, the access to resources for all and integrated foreign communities. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could add to Julia's answer, um, I think there is a huge potential for sharing or, or collaborative arrangements in public sector. In fact, we see uh, now Swedish public se sector, which includes schools, hospitals, um, municipalities uh, and different authorities, they realize how much resources that are idling in their positions. So now uh, many of these, especially municipalities, start organizing the sort of eBay's for their uh, products, which can be furniture or um, IT equipment, and they exchange uh, with organizations in the public sector for uh, tax reasons. But basically, you know, all the IT equipment which is not used in authority can now be used in uh, communal uh, kindergartens. Okay. Thank you. Professor Garay has sent a second question. Could the value created in the intermediation between peers be retained in some way so that it would, it would revert to the population itself? It's a challenging question. Okay. <clears throat> this is an interesting question. For me, ah. it rings the bell because uh, when I was preparing this presentation, I actually asked myself a question, what percent of the revenues of platforms actually goes to the peers versus platform? And I found number that up to 85% of the revenue of platforms actually goes back to the um, asset owners and asset uh, users. Only 15% is left to the platforms which gives us also a hint about the size of the economy, considering how much um, uh, this, uh, some of the beacons of the sharing economy are valued up to 30 and $40 billion. Okay, thank you. Well, I think I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity for, for doing my own question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, um, it's connected with the first question. Okay, we have, a, as you know, we have a big expectations about the, the the new budget, the new European budget for recovery and resilience, where, because it's essentially based on on promoting digital transformation and green transition. Okay, and you have uh, explained very well how uh, sharing economies in in urban environments could uh, moderate, maybe moderate the economic and social consequences of these pandemics. And also, it could be very useful uh, to promote a faster uh, economic recovery, okay? Are you optimistic about the use of this uh, funding? Are you talking about funding, research funding or funding for research, recovery? Research funding, yeah, research funding. Um, yes, I am optimistic. Uh, we do have the funding. 
Um, and uh, so far, we don't see that it will be taken from us. Um, I'm less optimistic about this um, support packages, economic packages that are pumped into our economies because this is our children and grandchildren that will be paying for, for this pandemic, essentially. So in that sense, um, if we want to learn uh, something or draw uh, learnings from the 2008 financial crisis, where we saw resurgence or, or appearance of the sharing economy, where people went back to their communities, to their close friends and uh, family to create the, uh, the sharing opportunities and create access uh, in the time of need. So I'm hoping that um, the research money will help um, understand how we can do this this time and also learning from the resistance of the platforms uh, themselves. Okay, thank you. Well, let me check if we have still any questions. Yes, I think that now I'm receiving a new questions from Vera Vidal here from the Diamond Research Group at the, at the walk. The question is, when talking about what goes back to the peers in the intermediation, what about data? What are? What about data? When talking about, the context is, when talking about what goes back to the peers in the yeah. intermediation process, what about data? Yeah, data is a big um, issue. I think there is also a lot of research money that are going into this because this is a Pandora box that we are just um, under trying to or starting to understand uh, the consequences. It has to do with the um, availability of data uh, that the platforms have from us when they trace um, our <laughs> existence uh, online uh, and on the platforms. There is also research that we try to um, um, put forward is understanding how the cities, the role of cities in uh, getting access to this data and putting them uh, for the so social and societal good. So my answer to this question is absolutely, this is a crucial direction for future research to understand uh, where data is created who uses the data, but also start developing regulatory frameworks to make sure that this data are used for our and societal good and not only for benefiting certain actors. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I think that you're, you're checking now that the, this has been a very interesting presentation because we have more questions. Now another very challenging question. This is from Catherine Lecouillet. The question is the following. Would you please explain how the digital platform generates positive economic impact, impacts mm -hmm. in its normative work? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my immediate thought goes to uh, accommodation sharing. Uh, the impacts there, the digital platforms, Airbnb, Nine Keys, VRBOs, um, the, the tourists that are coming to cities, uh, they spend their money there. Um, they uh, pay uh, often taxes, the platforms, but also now cities impose uh, taxation also on the, the hosts, uh, the asset or accommodation uh, owners. So in that sense, the, the money trickle down into the economy, into the cities. This is not, of course, to, um, we need to be aware about the negative effects. And what we see now, I think also with Barcelona and Amsterdam is uh, the engagement and the need for cities to step in in order to cap uh, the amount of activity and the amount of tourists that uh, these uh, platforms um, enable and, and facilitate um, in the cities. Okay. We're waiting for a new question. Well, I see that we don't have more questions. Yes, so we are on time. 
now. So then, thank you. All right, let me check it. Maybe a last question. No, that's all. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Then, thank you so much again, Oksana, for this interesting presentation, and also. Thank you to all the audience for their attendance and their stimulating questions. And just keep in mind that the parallel sessions will start at 11.30. And please check in the program of the workshop, the timing and the links for the presentation. See you in a few minutes. Bye. Bye-bye.